wrong slide. Um, I want to welcome you to our session on community science, communities solve problems with science and scientists. I would encourage you to move to the front of the room. We hope you will um, help us feel like a warm and welcoming audience. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, I'm Kathy Manduka. I'm from the Science Education Resource Center at Carleton College, and I'm a member of the AGU Board of Directors. Um, this uh, session focuses on community science, solving problems in communities, and this is our definition of community science, science scientists and communities doing science together to advance one or more community priorities. Um, I wanted to just say a few words about the scope of the way we have um, engaged with community scientists. There are three really important sets of actors in community science. The scientists who serve both in their role as researchers and in their ro roles as communicators and educators um, of science. Uh, what we've called policy makers, which we include with business. These are the people who are making uh, leadership decisions that set policy or put programs in place that shape um, uh, the activities of large groups in the community. And, the, and then we have citizens who, of course, are all the people in the grassroots working from the bottom. And, and um, I know you all understand the importance of both policymakers and citizens and the, and the feedback loops between them that make for sustainable and strong um, communities. So our session has examples of scientists working with policymakers, scientists working with citizens, and um, scientists working with uh, that whole um, amalgamation. And in our conception of community science, that all comes together into a, a, a tight um, working relationship where scientists, citizens, and policymakers work together to both co-construct the science and its use to learn together and to um, implement change. We hope you're going to be inspired by the presentations you're going to hear. They're all by people who have been successful in working in this realm. And I think that's our biggest goal in this session is just really to help um, inspire all of us to um, greater action. So, um, I just want to close by saying that this uh, session is brought to you by the Science to Action Work Group. And if you're excited by what you hear, you can join us. Um, we're a, a, one of the new engagement groups on AGU Connects. That's an open group. You can be part of us. You can have fun with us. We're going to go to the Rusty Nail tonight at uh, 6.30. Um, you're all welcome. And uh, there's more Science to Action sessions and posters in the meeting um, going on all day uh, today and tomorrow. And lastly, I just want to say that if you're intrigued by the background of my slides, it's actually meaningful to this session, and uh, Raj Pandya is going to discuss what it is in the concluding remarks. So I think we're ready to uh, start, and I'm pleased to see people still filing into the room, and I, I would again encourage you to come to the, the front of the room so that you can be part of, we're going to leave time for questions, and it'll be easier to hear them and uh, interact if people are at the front. So, so I'm delighted to welcome to the stage our first speaker. Can you hand me the, <laughs> the piece of paper with the speaker? This is Lisa Gromlich, um, and she is also a member of the AGU board, and she's going to speak to us about how design thinking can deepen the collaboration between scientists and society, lessons from innovation, from the innovation economy. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you for your good work in organizing this session. We are here because we are committed to connecting science, our science, to society. And we are here with 20,000 of our colleagues at this meeting who represent a veritable engine of science. So the opportunity before us is how do we make that connection? How do we up our game in connecting science to society, and how do we act with an urgency that is scoped to the seriousness and the dauntingness of the challenges that are facing us? I want to use my moment with you today to talk about innovation as one of the themes that we will see emerging from today's talks. And it reflects my own um, experiences as Dean of the College of the Environment and the person launching Earth Lab on the part of UW. 
So anyone who has been in my office is often subjected to me obsessing about this quote. Innovating requires that we identify problems that matter and moving through them systematically to develop elegant solutions. I want to unpack that for just a moment. Way too often we sit around conference tables and talk about how are we going to capture the low-hanging fruit. Notice this is not about the low-hanging fruit. This is about the gnarly problems that have no easy answers. We're talking about moving through them systematically, doing it in such a way that we are actually truly incorporating the kinds of information that we need, not just the people that are convenient to us in our own disciplines. And finally, developing elegant solutions, solutions that actually work out in the real world. So let's actually move through a couple of these pieces. When does a problem matter? Problems that matter have a human face. And I'm about to provide to you a set of quotes from Jeff Bezos. And if you're in Seattle, you know who Jeff Bezos is. And if you got an Amazon.com package sometime this week in anticipation of the holidays, you too know who Jeff Bezos is. He transformed, for better or worse, the way in which we consume and do commerce in this country. So, First Jeff Bezos quote, good inventors and designers deeply understand their customers. They spend tremendous energy developing that intuition. They study and understand many anecdotes rather than only the averages you'll find on surveys. A remarkable customer experience, cross that out and put stakeholder experience, starts with heart, intuition, curiosity, play, guts, and taste. How does that work in our world? I want to use the example of the Climate Impacts Group at the University of Washington. It was founded 20 years ago by Ed Miles, and Ed was the lucky recipient of the first NOAA RESA funding. Regional, it was, um, RESA stood for the Regional Integrated Science and Assessment Program. And his initial idea was that he was going to sort of connect stakeholders in the Pacific Northwest with science. And the first reaction he got was that the stakeholders weren't really interested. And they didn't see how, what, how they had a need for climate science. So Ed literally spent two years with the clock ticking and then suddenly his NOAA program officers not particularly happy as he went into a deep dive into who actually has the authority to make decisions. How are decisions made among natural resource agencies and the private sector in the Northwest? What is the basis of that information? What values underlie the decision process? Is it minimizing risk? Is it maximizing revenue? What, how do people actually use forecasts? And what became clear to Ed and his coworkers was that it was actually initially ideas about and concerns about climate variability. And that's where they started. They started with seasonal to decadal scale forecasts. They looked at how warm phases of ENSO increased the probability of low snowpack. They, it altered salmon returns. It increased the probability of drought and forest fire and created credibility in that community. In the end, this resulted in work that led to a groundbreaking and I would argue sort of the first truly comprehensive adaptation plan for climate change in the country led by Ed and his colleague Amy Snover at SIG. What do we know, learn from this is that information is used when in fact we have that deep, deep, deep knowledge and engagement with stakeholders. Okay, when is the solution elegant? Elegant cut, solutions cut across boundaries so they're actually used. Okay, I'm surely the only person at AGU who's going to cite something from the Hollywood Reporter. Here is Jeff once again. You can have the best technology, you can have the best business model, but if the storytelling isn't amazing, it won't matter, nobody will watch. When I moved to the Pacific Northwest in 2010, I became one of a number of people that was truly alarmed about global warming's evil twin, as it's sometimes called, ocean acidification. 
For years, I had taught in introductory global change classes that there was this really good news about the fact that the ocean had absorbed a third of industrial emissions of carbon dioxide. It was this great big sink. It was buying us time to be able to come up with plans for dealing with climate variability. Well, the problem with that great big sink is that when CO2 dissolves in ocean water, it forms carbonic acid. And what you see is, for the scientific community, this incredibly compelling image of a pteropod, a sea butterfly, a minute organism in the ocean, that when subjected to the kind of ocean acidity that we will see in the year 2100, completely dissolves, or starts to dissolve um, in 45 days. I walked around talking about this. It wasn't greatly compelling. Let's try another story. This is Mark Weigert. He and his wife, Sue Cudd, and their families have farmed oysters for the last thousand years. This is the Whiskey Creek Oyster Farm. They produce the little oyster larvae that is distributed all up and down the West Coast. It provides about 75% of the oyster larvae. If you have eaten oysters on the West Coast, you have eaten their, the products of their larvae. In 2006, they suddenly suffered 80% mortality in their oyster larvae. It was associated, initially they thought it was a disease, they finally realized with help from a number of, of scientific colleagues that it was actually associated with these really strong upwelling events where deeply, um, deep water was coming to the surface highly enriched in CO2. So it was exacerbating the ocean acidification um, activities that were already starting. Whiskey Creek collaborated with Oregon State University, Bert Hales in particular, to start water monitoring. They were able to monitor ocean acidification conditions, particularly upwelling, and they were able to predict when this was happening. They changed the water in the tanks, and the larval production recovered. In Washington State, this caught our eye because we have about a $300 million ocean um, oyster and industry that employs 3,000 people. That story was an incredibly compelling narrative. It caught the eye of then Governor Gregoire of Washington State, who conceived the Ocean Acidification Blue Ribbon Task Force. Once again, scientists sat for a long time. For a year, they met at regular intervals with long, long meetings with a variety of people from the private sector, from the tribes, elected officials, governmental officials, farmers, and came up with the Washington Ocean Acidification Action Plan that has been implemented in Washington and has served as a model for bringing science into, the, um, into stakeholders up and down the West Coast and across around the world. Why did this work? Part of the reason that it worked, it wasn't just a good story with interesting, compelling humans and beautiful pictures of oysters. It was a good story because the scientific data were there, and equally importantly, the scientists were willing to commit to a process that would result in an action plan that was a long-term consultation process that continues to this day. Okay. What is our greatest obstacle? One more quote from Jeff. If you're going to invent, it means you're going to experiment. And if you're going to experiment, you're going to fail. And if you're going to fail, you have to think long term. We're part of AGU, getting ready to celebrate its centennial. We're part of institutions, I'm looking around the crowd, that are invested in the long term. And yet sometimes we don't act like it. So. How is it that we actually think about failure? How can we afford failure? We get nervous about this. How can we, how can we do anything risky in a time in which the uh, society trusts science less and less? How can an assistant professor or a soft money researcher engage in this kind of work that might fail? And if we don't confront these questions, we're not taking innovation seriously. I look out at a generation of students, postdocs, early career scientists that are eager to do this kind of work. They're ready to take this up. And way too often, they get the message that, wait, 
wait a few years, wait until you get tenure. And this is a process that could be 10 to 15 years from when they're a, senior, they're a student. We can't give them this message. We have to thread the needle of acting with urgency while continuing long-term engagement with foremost in our mind. I'm looking out and I see among my, my, the people here enough people who are senior enough that they sit on hiring committees. They sit on promotion and tenure committees. They are putting to, they are the keepers of the institutional cultures, whether it's academic or non-academic, in the AGU. And I'm calling upon you to work with me. As a dean, I can only go so far. We have got to, among our senior ranks, make it a place where we embrace the kind of risk taking that this work entails, celebrate it, and ensure that our next generation of scientists firmly engages in it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Stay put for a minute. Oh, okay. It means you have time to take questions. Are there questions for Lisa? Yes. Stand up and shout. <laughs> Absolutely. I would say research is the bedrock on which we do this work and innovation. And I actually want to, innovating, I really like the verb versus the noun, is the process by which there is an iterative loop between moving that research into a public sphere, seeing, getting feedback from that public sphere, and continuing to do it. The reason we could act, whether it's on climate variability or ocean acidification, is that there was a bedrock of often federally funded National Science Foundation, NOAA, science, that we knew how those systems worked. Without that, we cannot be an innovation engine. Are there other questions? You get to do this until 2. Huh? No, no, no. We're, that's coming. I know, but you said it with two minutes for questions. Let's just, let's okay. keep going. Great, thank you. So our next speaker is uh, uh, Fasal Hussein. He's going to talk to, he's gonna take a different part of the triangle that I showed you of working with citizens and, uh, and uh, uh, community leaders and uh, talk to us about taking research and knowledge to the common people. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good morning everyone. Really honored to be here with you all. I want to thank the organizers, especially Julie and her outstanding colleagues, but I'm especially thrilled to be speaking after one of my most favorite person on campus at the same institution. I'm not saying this because she's the dean and a very powerful person. I'm saying it because she once said something that's been you know, embedded in my head, which is a vision without a budget is hallucination. And it's something for us to talk about because if we're gonna talk about science into action, I think the money matters are also important. So I liked your Jeff Bezos quote, it was very appropriate, and I hope we have more sessions that talk about money matters. Um, let's see. It's fine. Okay, so I wanna contextualize this problem about you know, taking uh, research and knowledge to the common people uh, in the context of water security, so, um, you know, because it helps us understand the situation a little better. Uh, but it's just an idea, you, know, it, you, you could apply the thoughts and uh, these uh, best practices that I'll be sharing with you to any other problem. So we know the world population is increasing. Bring this here. And, um, you know, a uh, consequence of that is we're urbanizing, so we're creating these big cities um, that are really concentrated hubs for resources. And if you're biased towards fresh water like I am, I'll put it in the middle and you know, there would be interactions among other types of resources. And it's a very complicated issue where you know, one resource is dependent on the other in a kind of a very uh, dynamically coupled way. And one of the ways we're trying to address this, whether you like it or not, to ensure we have a steady supply of um, water is trying to store them up as what water magic would do to ensure that we have a steady supply in reservoirs. And we're seeing more and more of that in the developing world. 
I know uh, in the developed world, I know reuse, conservation, recycling is more prevalent, but in the developing world, we're seeing a tremendous amount of water resources development through impoundments coming up. So let's just say, you know, as an example, as an academic example, that we wanted to understand what's really going on with the water security around us, what are the challenges, and let's just say that, you know, there is a tool out there, satellite remote sensing. We've seen a lot of papers being published about its capabilities and what the science that it can enable. Let's see, let's just say that it has solutions to offer to us. And indeed they do. Um, so here I'm showing you a couple of missions that are out there uh, flying or will be flying very soon. You have on your uh, left GPM, Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. You have SMAP for soil moisture. You have a future mission dedicated for surface water called Surface Water Ocean Topography. And, of course, we have a whole wide area of other environmental sensors in space looking down on Earth, taking up pulse of Earth, that we could use to understand what's going on with the state of our water security. So we, uh, I'll show you a couple of examples where we've been able to take this to, from the science domain to an action or uh, on the ground domain to make an impact and take the benefits of that to the common people. So here's an example, you know, groundwater st stock projection in Pakistan. Many of you may recall reading in this 2005 Nature paper about groundwater mining in Western India and, you know, uh, Eastern Pakistan region. So here's something that is being used actually operationally. The, uh, the two satellites, the GRACE and GPM, are being used in a routine manner by the Pakistan government to uh, get a handle on how the uh, groundwater stocks are uh, projected to decline and then again get recharged again so that they can get an idea of what's really happening between these rivers and uh, this region that is very important for agricultural development. And also it beats the in situ ground way of monitoring your water stocks because it's very time consuming and also costly. There's another one which uh, uh, a more recent one, example that we've been able to achieve, uh, which is about trying to grow more with less resources. Or in other words, it's like trying to minimize, uh, you know, uh, the wastage when you try to grow food. So it's, again, the same location in Pakistan. You're seeing the world's largest irrigation system. Originally, when it was designed by the British in the 1940s, it was designed for about 50 million people and for about one crop a year growing pattern. The reality today is we have about 200 million people and they're growing two and a half crops approximately. So it's a surface water based irrigation system and what the farmers are doing there is because the surface water now is not enough, they're trying to supplement that with the groundwater and they're doing something that we call flood irrigation which is often uh, wasteful. It's a practice that's been handed down by generations and oftentimes we see, especially with the production of rice and other staple crops, that there is a lot of wastage of water that really doesn't need to happen. So how do we change the farmer's mindset and give them a more science-based solution where they could actually know that situations where they don't really need to apply that much water because the environmental factors that we can predict and forecast tell us otherwise. So there's a solution like this, you know, this is kind of like a, a fifth grade kind of schematic. You had to show it in a middle school. You have the sensors up in the sky trying to monitor the weather and the environment. Also, you have your numerical weather prediction models that assimilate all these uh, information from sensors and try to predict or forecast, now cast and forecast, the weather conditions which can then tell you about what the crop water demand will be and you try to get that to the mobile devices that these farmers have. And you can see this farmer actually is standing on ankle deep water. It's pretty wasteful. It's a surface water irrigation system. And behind them, you, you see, I believe that's uh, corn. And the idea is to tell them of ish situations where they don't need to be pumping groundwater to irrigate as much, where they can avoid the, the wastage if they know that they're going to get rain in the next couple of years, or uh, next couple of days, sorry or they already have received enough based on what the crops really need. And what you see in the lower right is from John Foley's work that you may have seen before. Wherever you see intense colors of red, it's actually showing the amount of water you're using to grow um, 
calories of uh, crop or, or food. So basically it's a liter per kilocalorie. So you see a tremendous amount of inefficiency, inefficiency in growing staple crops in the South Asian region. So it looks like this. You try to get the science-based solutions down to the individuals, to the citizens, to decision makers, the farmers, so that they can make a decision if they want to, if they feel that there is value in it. And of course, it's contextualized in the local language. We call them friends, farmers, so that they know that we like them. And the question then comes is, all these solutions, are they working, or how well do they work? So we did do an impact study of this, a quantitative impact. And what we did see is that if this solution was applied to about a million farmers in that region, you'd be saving about 25 billion cubic meters of water from the ground. To put it in context, Grand Coulee Dam is about 25 cubic kilometer or 25 billion cubic meters. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Grand Coulee is six uh, cubic kilometers or six billion cubic meters of water. So it's like uh, about you know four Grand Coulee dams of water that you would be saving a year by trying to minimize the waste. We also noticed that approximately you get about 40% saving in irrigation water by avoiding those situations where you don't need to really flood the crops uh, with flood irrigation when the crops really have enough from the rain. And uh, surprisingly, 80% of the farmers are responding to it. And the most important thing when it comes to mining matters is, you know, why should they be using this? You know, what's in there? What's the economic incentive? We're talking about livelihood matters. So we have seen cases where this science-based solution actually doubles farmers' income. So this is a very, I think, a key point. If we've got to make science really work and be sustainable, I think we have to talk about what Lisa once said is, the vision has to have a budget or the dream has to have a revenue model behind it. Otherwise, it's really not going to thrive. So speaking about timelines of national scale adoption, you know, many years back, I was involved in this flood forecasting project. It took us five years to take it from the science domain to the application domain. When we went to another country, in Pakistan, it took us one year. And more recently, this project that I talked to you about, it took us four months. So how did we manage to go from five years to four months? Of course, one benefit is if you keep working on the same region, you get better at it because you're getting more calibrated to the situations, you're getting more efficient, you know what the hurdles to expect on forecasting, you could duck or avoid them. Right? But there's a tip, couple of other things I want to share with you that I believe that kills time in getting solutions on the ground, solutions that are very time sensitive, where people need that to make an impact on their livelihood. One is, you know, we often ignore how people learn inductively. I'll talk about it uh, very sh and shortly. We also forget that these consumers, I'm using the term consumer, it's like Jeff Bezos did, or call it stakeholders, they're more aligned to their realities on the ground than we are. Um, we miss the low-hanging fruits. And I, I want to stress that low-hanging fruits are also important because sometimes when you're trying to go for those very sophisticated science-based solutions, we often ignore the easier ones we could do first that would get our feet on the ground or the door, at the foot on the door so that we could uh, you know, build that engagement and do more. And of course, the ivory tower mindset is there. What is needed? I think preaching beyond the choir, so not just AGU, uh, getting more involved on the ground. Uh, the one thing that I would like to stress here is, I think, number five, which is I really think we have to start talking about you know, what kind of revenue models will work to get science into action, the commercialization aspect of it. Innovation is needed, but how do we make it sustain itself? Uh, so this is where I get into the inductive learning. I think it's worth looking into the human DNA of how we learn. We learn actually inductively, because since the dawn of civilization, we never inherited a book on physics or chemistry. We learned from specific examples, then we generalized them into knowledge. right? And that's how most people learn in reality on the ground. But at the industrial scale in K to 16, when our kids go to school or college, they're learning the other way around, which is deductive learning. Of course, you have to do that because you don't have millions of years to become educated. You have to get it done in 16 years. And we try to address this inductive learning by adding research experiences and all that. But I think it's important for us to appreciate that for the common people, if they're going to appreciate the science solutions that we are telling them to use, they'll learn and appreciate it in a inductive way. So some apple falling moments are very critical. 
So once societal application models work well, I'm coming to an end that we, uh, you know, have seen it to be very effective is uh, work with a large group of stakeholders or agents or brokers uh, for the common people, for the science, and then uh, try to identify some quality specimen from them and then bring them to your laboratory like University of Washington or some other educational environment and then uh, train them well in a two-way fashion and then have official uptake. So my conclusion is, you know, for science to action, building durable societal applications, I think it needs a two-way long-term strategy. So long-term is very important. Lisa stressed that in Jeff Bezos' quote again, because we're going to fail time and time again. And uh, we need to understand that we need to preach beyond our choir. And the beneficiary stakeholders are not our choir, like the scientific community is. And use inspired doesn't mean it's user ready. And I think I've shared that with a lot of people. They're two different things. Once you get busy with that, get your hands dirty and trying to get the science to work, it's a totally different world. And last thing, I hope I can impress on you that I think science really needs a revenue model. And we need to start talking about what is that revenue model going to be so that we can sustain it, whether we have a lot of long-term funding from the regular sources or not. So with that, I want to thank you so much. And I'll take questions. I just want to make a quick plug in here. There's a little uh, documentary that's been running at the AGU Cinema. I think they just finished it. It's called Cotton Fields from the Ivory Tower. It is set partly in the University of Washington, partly in a faraway region. I encourage you to watch it if you have. It's free. You don't have to pay for anything. Thank you. We have time for one question uh, over here. Please stand up and yell. <laughs> so right now in Pakistan, it's 10,000 farmers, and it's gearing up for uh, more like 100,000 in the, this coming year. But we're also expanding to India, where we're talking in now millions with the local uh, stakeholders. So in seven years, we hope to reach out to 50 million through a revenue model. So totally independent, commercializing that idea. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Next, we'll hear from uh, David Zismansky. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, connecting students and policymakers through science and service learning. Oh. Well, thank you. Good morning. Um, I want to start out just by, again, thanking the conveners. I've been thinking about the charge for all the science to action sessions that have been put together. And today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, uh, specifically about connecting some new uh, advocates for STEM education and for kind of the work that we do and use uh, for policy making. And I, I was really energized by some of the takeaways from both Faisal's and, and uh, Lisa's talks. And specifically I want to mention that the work I'm going to be talking about today was actually done uh, pre-tenure. So as a tenure track professor at Bentley University. And I'll tell you two things that will make maybe the presentation less confusing. I'm a geologist that works at a business university. And also I am a former congressional science fellow. So that might help in uh, discussion. So I'm going to talk about service learning. And for those of you, uh, most of you are probably aware of service learning. We've been a little bit slower than some other disciplines to integrate it into our field. Uh, but service learning is more than just community service. It's got to be linked rigorously with academic learning objectives. Uh, it often involves face-to-face -face interaction, but it doesn't have to. So going out and working with the very young, the old, uh, homeless, other things like that. But there are also uh, more what we call overtly intellectual forms of service learning as well, which include things like technological and scientific consulting, grant writing. We have a huge program at Bentley University that has brought in tens of thousands of dollars uh, for community centers through grant writing, students doing the work, uh, and then also research. So in asking this question, we have to figure out who the community partner is and what we mean by that. Is it uh, a defined community that's local? Is it an underserved population that could just mentioned a few? Uh, is it more broadly the United States, worldwide? It can be any of them, but it's really got to be contextualized for the student if you want to get the, the kind of the basic understanding of who they're working for. What I'm going to argue today is that service learning, especially within the geosciences, engenders civic engagement. 
both in a general sense in that it gets students invested in the community and problems that we all face, again, from these kind of local to grand challenges of sustainability. And then pointedly, I think this is probably equally important, it gets students involved uh, politically. It gets them involved in the political participation. In terms of civic engagement, I think that the geosciences in particular, but more broadly, uh, we have the potential to apply both disciplinary and transdisciplinary concepts, what we're teaching in the classroom, in the context of civic engagement. And in doing this, even though we work, a lot of us work with geology majors, many of us don't. Many of us work more broadly with other students, other majors. And I will argue that we can engage many new stakeholders by doing service learning in a very pointed way, and that's advocating for science. I will also use this as the context to demonstrate that I think of what we're already kind of hearing in some of the talks is that geoscience is probably the least overtly relevant uh, of the sciences to what the public sees. But as we know, and I think this is our battle cry for many years, is that what we're doing is probably the most important in terms of the application to solving some of the societal problems. And that's why I use the context of sustainability. It's something that everybody understands. Uh, geoscience, of course, does a particularly good job of thinking in systems, which is required to address some of these wicked problems, right? We know that. But I will also argue that sustainability provides a lens for all students, and in particular, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I get business students involved in this. So coming from a business perspective, I love the business quotes, business doesn't need sustainability professionals, but rather professionals that are capable of making sustainable decisions in any role. And so one thing we know as scientists who are advocates is that strengthening the role of the sciences in public decision making is hard. We know this because we do congressional visits, we go uh, through AGU, we go through GSA, our professional societies, and we make the effort. But I'm going to talk about today that we also need the voices of non-STEM majors, non-geology, non-geoscience, and more broadly non-STEM majors to make the case for us. So the way that I come at this at a business university, uh, and Bentley was part of a study in 2011 by the Carnegie Foundation that looked at how we can better integrate the arts and sciences in business. In a 21st century economy, if you don't understand that business needs to be part of the solution to what we're talking about, you'll never make the case to the geosciences. So in this study that Bentley was part of, the focus was on how do we better educate both business students and non-business students to integrate ideas from the arts and sciences and business. And that study identified kind of four ways of thinking that all students need to be really adept at. The first one is practical reasoning. Coming from a business institution, this is part and parcel of how we educate our students. They are trained as an accountant. Bentley started as a two-year accounting school. Uh, they know how to do the practical reasoning side. But then the thing we all, hopefully, are trying to engage our students in, the analytical thinking, uh, systems thinking, and then along with that, multiple framing, the idea that two things simultaneously that look opposed can be true, which is probably one of the harder things to grapple with. And then also a big idea of why we stress that an undergraduate education is important is because there's reflective exploration for meaning. The questions of who am I, what am I doing here, why do I exist, that can be done through service learning as well. So Bentley University, I mentioned, is a business school. We're a four-year private undergraduate school. We've got about 4,000 undergraduates. 95% of our students major in business fields, but we do have about 10 arts and science uh, fields as well. But part of the way that we integrate the arts and sciences is even if you do a business major, finance, accounting, marketing, you also have the opportunity to complete a second major in liberal studies that's focused in a particular theme, in my case, uh, in earth environment and global sustainability. And again, even if you choose to major in a arts and science field, you can conduct a second uh, major, which is business uh, studies, and all of our students then come out with kind of the requisite, requisite skills to get a great job. We have a 98% placement rate, with it, which I have not seen uh, at other universities. So we do have a Department of uh, Natural and Applied Sciences, which makes us fairly unique, but we do have three geologists, which is amazing for a school our size. So our students actually get experience in the field. On the left, you'll see one of my students uh, out doing some 
uh, carbonate testing uh, some streams in the Kentucky Mountains. That's Bobby Mercer. On the right-hand side, a student doing some work on paleo uh, uh, core sampling, looking at uh, some soils coming out of the, uh, the bottom lake bottom sediments in Colorado. But I'm going to talk about a course that I involve service learning in, uh, in the department, and that's uh, science and environmental policy. So ostensibly, this is a course where students come in and they learn a bit about the earth science behind one of our big environmental problems. So for example, if it's a air pollution problem, we talk about the science of, of uh, air quality, and then we also talk about the policy side. So we talk about how science either informs the process of making policy or how it doesn't look at legislation, which you might find in a typical environmental policy course. But then I also offer an optional fourth credit to the course where a student can actually conduct a service learning credit. They work with me, it's supposed to be 20 hours, it ends up being much more. Uh, but they work for a nonprofit in Washington, D.C., doing some sort of policy research that they need. So this then involves civic engagement, research for the community partner, but then also uses their business skills that they're getting in their other classes. And I will say that these students are better than any student I've ever seen at actually conducting the research because they know business process, they under, have a great understanding of how businesses work. So for the first three years that I did this as an assistant professor when I was developing it, the students would work for Earth Environment, excuse me, the Earth and Energy uh, Study Institute, Environmental and Energy Study Institute in Washington, D.C., and they focused a lot on energy projects uh, where they would do some a uh, piece of research that would help inform what they were trying to do as far as informing Congress on gaps in policy. So a lot of those focused on energy. We make the rounds in Capitol Hill. Uh, we actually go to places like the EPA. There's one of my former students uh, meeting with uh, EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy at the time. Uh, my old boss on Capitol Hill, Senator Tester, this is one of the first groups we worked with. And then we actually ask uh, the students to come up from their research to come up with some sort of idea of what they want to ask uh, when they're making the rounds. This is the result of the first year. Uh, they got four sitting senators to write letters to the EPA and the Small Business Administration asking them to better coordinate their efforts on behalf of small businesses uh, and some gaps in policy for energy efficiency. Most recently, we've been working with AGI, uh, and I need to uh, give thanks, by the way, to Leila Gonzalez and Mae Boland at AGI, who have been great partners over the last few years. Uh, we have a lot of fun working with them while we're there. Uh, they present to our partners. So the project that this group of students that I'm going to talk about worked on, they actually did a user experience uh, and uh, kind of audience outreach survey looking at the Critical Issues website for AGI and how they could improve it. And specifically, they were looking at the Critical Issues Research Database, which is attempting to gain uh, kind of stakeholders coming in and finding geoscience information they didn't know they needed. So the students write up a report for the partner. Uh, then I also require them to come up with a one-pager that they use on Capitol Hill. So the idea is they take what they've gleaned from their understanding of the project to actually apply it to the real world, what policymakers are doing. Uh, this is uh, Bobby Mercer, and uh, I mentioned him before, who did field work with me. He's delivering the report to our nonprofit partner, to AGI, uh, discussing what they found in terms of user experience, as well as what they found from their survey with policymakers. So then we go to Capitol Hill, we make the rounds, we take meetings with both uh, senators and representatives in the, the House of Representatives. And this is a student, Mari Maroka, who is uh, actually speaking with our uh, congressional uh, district representative in Bentley, uh, for Bentley. And she's talking about what they found and kind of the need. It was just perfect timing. Catherine Clark was about to go into a, a House meeting. She's on the Science Committee to mark up the America Competes Act, uh, Act reauthorization. And so uh, she was actually able to use the argument that Mari was making to go into that meeting. And as a matter of fact, she followed up and she asked if she could uh, make a floor speech. So we worked with a couple of her staffers to actually help uh, craft a floor speech using the argument. Can you click on that? Are you able to? So let me show you a little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the gentlelady from Texas for yielding. 
Bentley University is a renowned business school in my district. And when a class from Bentley visited me just a few weeks ago, they were advocating for a critical underpinning of our economy. These students came to discuss the importance of funding the geosciences in the NSF. Why? Because it's good business. These students and the business community understand the critical role that geoscience has in disaster resilience. Help okay, I know we need to wrap up, but I'll leave it there. Uh, and I will be there tonight, so I'd be happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk a little bit more informally about this. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you. Next, we'll hear from Mark Benthian. Uh, Mark will describe uh, a project about earthquake preparedness and education, a collective impact approach to improving awareness and resiliency. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to go very quickly to the overview of a program we have at the Southern California Earthquake Center. There's uh, partners involved. Uh, Bob DeGruyter, are you here? Uh, he was going to be with us, one of the uh, collaborators in this effort with USGS. Uh, also, Michelle Wood at Cal State Fullerton, who leads a lot of our evaluation activity that draws on. So Southern California Earthquake Center is a research center studying earthquakes. Uh, our focus is on the Southern California and really California area as a whole. We consider it a natural laboratory. I run our communication, education, and outreach program. And kind of in this theme of the session, our, it fits with our theme of the next five years, which we call Partner Globally, Prepare Locally. And prepare there really expands not just physically preparing for an earthquake, but being prepared as a society, as students, et cetera. And uh, one key area I'm gonna focus on here is uh, the great shakeout earthquake drills and our leadership of that, and how we've uh, learned about the collective impact theory and are looking to apply that in that effort. So our SCEC Communication Education Outreach Program, at, or we call CEO, uh, has four focus areas, and they really connect in many ways but we've organized our key activities into these areas, which I'm gonna just breeze through very quickly here and then focus on the shakeout. So uh, these focus areas also have, we've, we've identified these four long-term outcomes that really do kind of overlap across these areas. And we think that's very key. So it's an integrated program and not siloed as much as we can. And we do have a comprehensive logic model that we've been developing and are implementing to really look at how are we um, uh, f implementing the programs and tracking their success over time to uh, achieve these long-term outcomes. And, and overall, the goal is to improve awareness and preparedness and also science resiliency, which is kind of the chicken and the egg type of situation in that, uh, you know, the more uh, you have science literacy, the more uh, improved decisions people can make towards their resiliency. So just kind of breezing through the knowledge implementation areas, really our more technical outreach of science communication that we do with our partners in engineering and building officials and, and insurance industry, all those that are using earthquake information to make uh, informed decisions. A lot of partners in this, of course, uh, through our research, uh, our researchers across the country, the USGS, uh, others that work together to develop uh, the, the right tools and evaluations, predictions, forecasts, uh, understanding of earthquake phenomena. And that really means a lot of engagement with, with uh, kind of those technical users of our information. 
One example of this is we're partnering with the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute in a major conference this summer. It's a quadrennial conference. It's going to be in Los Angeles uh, that we're a co-sponsor of. We're really uh, co-leading a lot of the efforts uh, to uh, bring together scientists and engineers and policymakers. Our experiential learning and career advancement focus area is our summer internship programs. And we have two. We have the kind of traditional one-on-one -on -one program that we call SURE, and also our Use IT program, which is the most clever acronym ever invented, I think. Um, it is undergraduate studies in earthquake information technology. So we're having undergraduate students uh, apply information technology. And in the last couple of years, they've been using high-performance computers. They've been using uh, the nation's supercomputers in their summer eight-week program, about 22 to 25 students a summer. We've had hundreds of students in these programs, and one of the most successful things that we do. We also are starting a new program we call the Transitions Program, which is really focused on making sure that a diverse group of students from the undergraduate level are transitioning into graduate school and geoscience careers. So we're really expanding out uh, that making sure that not only are we providing these research opportunities, but that we're making sure that those students can continue. Our, what we call K through 14 Earthquake Education Initiative has a number of projects that we've worked on for many years, and the, each of these almost has its own presentation I could do uh, that touches on this collective impact approach, which I have learned about through the, uh, the last one here, uh, partnership with, with Kathy and Raj and others who are uh, here. Uh, uh, and I've learned about the collective impact framework. And that's been really exciting to look at what we've been doing and how it fits within that framework. And uh, th if you're not familiar with it, there are these five key elements having a common agenda, having common progress measures, having mutually reinforcing activities, communica uh, continuous communication, and having a, oh, a backbone organization, I noticed that typo, uh, <laughs> that, um, that really fit together. And it was really interesting to see this and, and look at uh, what we've been doing and, and kind of the values we've had fit to where we can use this as a new model to learn and improve what we're doing. So this really kind of especially touches on what we call our public education and preparedness focus areas. One example of this is a new project over the last year called the Geohazards Messaging Collaboratory, bringing together IRIS and UNAVCO, SCEC, and now also USGS and NOAA to make sure we're coordinating public messaging before, during, and after earthquake uh, situations, earthquake, uh, when earthquakes happen. We're having webinars for media and scientists uh, and uh, we've, we've been uh, doing communication workshops at our various annual meetings, and it's really starting to ramp up. Another area is what we call the Earthquake Country Alliance. This is a California-based public-private grassroots partnership that uh, has many of these aspects of the collective impact framework uh, that we've developed since 2003, and is really the, the organization that coordinates earthquake preparedness activities in California with a lot of partners. And one aspect that it really has been valuable is that having as a group of people from many organizations and different types of, uh, 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 you know, again, public, private, and grassroots who, uh, uh, representatives who can really work together to, to improve the messaging resources that we have and as simple as even the graphics we use to, uh, to communicate safety messaging, I won't go into all the details, but there are significant changes in, in this based on that, con that consensus messaging. For example, uh, in that drop box where we recommend during an earthquake to get down on the ground, he's no longer hitting his head on the table. And in fact, there's no longer a table there because we don't want a mes message that says you only protect yourself if you can get under a table, that getting down on the ground is key. So working on that. Now this is really kind of leading to the great shakeout earthquake drills. I hope you have heard about this before, maybe even participated. I'm sorry if you've, if you've uh, hurt your knees uh, getting it on the ground and participating. Um, I have this weird role of 
every year getting millions of people down under the ground. Uh, and uh, this year, 57 million people through earthquake drills across the country and around the world are participating. And it's really become a common framework uh, for this type of messaging and coordination and science outreach. And we do communicate, I'm not touching a lot on the, the science that get communicated through ShakeOut, but it's significant in a lot of the messaging that we put out. In fact, it's based on science. The USGS-led uh, project back in 2008, the ShakeOut scenario for a major earthquake in Southern California. And it was going to be an exercise with the first responders. And we said, how do we get everybody else to be able to participate? We had five and a half million people participate in what it was going to be a one-time event. And it's really expanded uh, far beyond anyone's expectations. A lot of that is because we applied social science research on what it uh, motivates people to take preparedness actions, some of these key factors, basically social cueing and milling and all these aspects that lead people to take action because they're interacting with each other, they're seeing what other people do, uh, are doing, and we're really trying to put those into practice. But that's kind of like the, the kind of like the, the, one level of what we've been doing, how we've done that and how we've expanded it and how we've in, in, involved so many partners has been kind of ad hoc over the years and we learn as we go. And this applying the collective impact uh, framework is really interesting to, to understand what's, where we've been successful and where we can improve. So as far as a common agenda, ShakeOut was created through partnerships across many types of organizations. And, and, and as new regions have involved, it's in, involved more and more people with new ideas, and that's been really exciting as part of that effort. So we have common goals of encouraging people to practice earthquake safety, but beyond that, shifting the culture to uh, even talking about earthquakes in new ways is uh, to get people talking about preparedness as something is possible, something that's real. Uh, fun new ways, getting Dwayne Johnson The Rock to do a PSA for us. Uh, you know, when he does a movie that we also had to had some issues with. Um, but, um, and then also from that, increasing actual earthquake readiness at all levels, uh, leading to not just individuals having more water, but cities making decisions as they've done uh, in Southern California and Los Angeles in particular, through the work of Lucy Jones from USGS and others, to uh, actually require new retrofitting ordinances for various types of buildings. So, uh, shakeouts across the country. In fact, this year we've added and filled in the missing gap. We've created the Great Upper Midwest Shakeout, which is really just a place where people can go and register their participation. They had been participating for years in small numbers, but we're increasing that there. And we have uh, state, regional, and national customized websites, so really trying to also make this as local as possible. Uh, those websites are in multiple languages. And then the mutually reinforcing activities aspect of collective impact is interesting because we've created this infrastructure and then people can bring themselves to it. They can help kind of create and add to and develop uh, the messaging and the resources that we develop, and, and they're taking it and sharing it out there. So there's. It really is kind of a feedback uh, aspect to it that's been really satisfying and exciting to see. When we come across things we didn't know about that people have made, videos, et cetera, that's one of the most exciting things to, to uh, discover. We do have, uh, given the audience, uh, a variety of higher education shakeout resources. If you want to have a shakeout drill and you're, if you're an instructor, you go to shakeout.org slash colleges and find some easy resources to use for that. Of course, ShakeOut is also very data-driven in terms of the registration that people do. They register, then they get counted, then they get listed, and then that can be used locally um, for local emergency managers who want to assess their impact of their outreach efforts. And, and, and it seems to have really excited people to want to participate. So they get registered, they get listed, they get total, they get on the website, and then they're very upset if they're not listing, and they're like, why aren't I on there? And I said, well, because when you registered, you said, I don't want to be listed. Uh, and so there's a little, <laughs> always that type of, of interaction. But people are, are using this to get their organization's approval to participate and have the time for a drill because they can point, look at all these other organizations like ours that are involved. So schools and colleges and, and governments are the larger participants, uh, but there are many others that can um, be involved. Continuation, or the continuous communication is also central through the messaging we do through our participants, but also our partners in social media. 
and SCEC is a background organization that really is working across all of these areas to make this all work. And it's, so overall, I should say we also are doing the same thing now for Tsunami. And overall, it's been really interesting to look at this framework and look to see how we can to really get deeper into it, understanding it and how we can apply it to ShakeOut and all our activities that we do. Thank you. Time for one quick question. I have a question. Um, Mark, can you say something about, uh, um, you, one of the things that is most impressive about ShakeOut is the way you've gotten to scale. And I wonder if you could say something about how you, the role of the K-12 system and your interactions with them and how that's been helpful or not helpful. <laughs> so, and, it, and it varies from place to place. So the West Coast, the schools are more, they're, they're even required to, uh, in California, for example, to do these type of drills. But by focusing on schools that has, provided a large enough kind of initial group that we can then in, encourage others to participate. And there, there's a, a lot of coordination at the local level between having schools that can work with their neighboring businesses and have a whole community events and drills that we're looking to expand going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, our next speaker is Lorna Katz from um, the Climate Program Director at Denver Water and also will soon be leading the Water Utility Climate Alliance and she'll be talking to us about successful collaboration and co-production. Good morning everyone, thanks for having me. I'm um, excited to be here to tell you a story of um, Denver Water's path on how we got to where we are today. So if you guys have been around for uh, this morning's panel, um, or this morning's session I guess, there were a lot of great ideas that I'm just gonna be um, articulating through story. So I'm excited that they were so well articulated and um, I don't have to point them out as explicitly <laughs> um, in, this, in this presentation. And I'm uh, with Denver Water, so that's a drinking water um, utility. So I'm gonna tell you a story from Denver Water's perspective, but if you're not interested in water, this is still incredibly relevant um, to applied science. So um, I hope you get something out of it. So about 15 years ago, um, Denver Water was doing long range planning. Actually, we've been doing long range planning for the last 100 years. So, you know, pretty progressive, right? Um, but we started doing integrated resource planning um, in the 90s, and uh, 15 years ago is when our story starts. And going into the early 2000s, we were using historical hydrology, right, so observed hydrology from 1947 to 1991 to understand and reflect uh, what hydrologic conditions were of today and what they would look like in the future. Uh, we use extrapolation of past trends, um, and we were using that to inform what our demands could look like in the future, what supply we may need. So at that time, we really understood how our system worked. We understood our risks, right, because we have this period of record that we're planning for. It has a pretty nasty drought, has a couple of wet decades, a couple of dry decades. Um, so we understand variability, we understood our risks, and we really understood how well our system would respond in that context. Um, so we were sitting fat and happy, you guys, frankly. We, we were talking about, okay, we're in Colorado. We know it's dry. It's the Southwest. Um, what are we going to do with our excess water, <laughs> right? That's where we're sitting in, in the early 2000s. And what type of regional role are we going to want to play? So fast forward. Oops, going backwards. Um, along comes the year 2002. And 2002 is a game changer across our state. Um, what we're looking at here is the single worst drought, single worst year we've ever experienced on record. So this is our largest reservoir um, in uh, the top corner, and you can see that the docks are grounded. This is after a single year. In these reservoirs, our water system is built to manage four years of drought. This is a single year. It was completely devastating. That same year, the worst wildfire the state had ever seen took place in our working horse watershed. Um, this is, so this reservoir that we're looking at is on the west slope, on the west side of the Continental Divide. This forest fire is on the east side of the Continental Divide. And our, you know, Denver is on the, the east side of the divide, right? So it completely devastated all of our, um, our reservoirs and conveyance systems. Um, 
because a few days after the forest fire went out, we had this extreme, uh, we, it wasn't even an extreme precipitation event. We had a rain event and that brought all the sedimentation and debris down into our watersheds. So we're in a drought, we just had this nasty fire and we have to, um, we have to push all this water through our system. We can't treat any of this water because it's filled with ash and sedimentation. So we're letting water go downstream because we can't do anything with it. Um, and then a few years later, we started, of course, experiencing Beetokil, which you know uh, uh, was pretty devastating across the entire continental divide. So our first question was, what <laughs> is going on here? Is this something that our region has experienced in the past? So we did a deep dive into paleohydrology. And what we learned is that, well, yeah, you know, our, we're in the Southwest, right? There are much worse droughts than what we experienced in the 50s. And you know, we need to be aware of those. But 2002, to my knowledge, is still one of the worst single years on record. So it's still a little bit different. And we look at over 300 years of paleohydrology. The next question was, well, what could we be up against in the future? OK, I'm going backwards again. Sorry about that. Um, so we, we worked with some partners. We, we rallied some other water utilities across um, the state. Uh, well, actually, just across the Front Range, other large water utilities, to work together to do a deep dive into some climate science. Because we were really confident that science was going to solve this problem and tell us what we need to prepare for in the future. Um, so we worked together. We're like, OK, well, we share our water comes from the same watersheds. Uh, the climate projections are coarse. Uh, let's work together. We can come up with uh, cohesive messages if we ever want to talk to media, which we still haven't, about this. And this was in 2008. Uh, we would have political coverage. So there's a lot of utilities in Colorado who still don't talk about climate, climate variability and climate change, right? They can talk about drought, but that's about it. So it gave them the political club coverage to be able to engage on a project like this. Um, we were able to coordinate on investigations we didn't even know about because we had partners in the room. Uh, who were working on things that were really helpful. We could pull all of our money together, um, and we could pull all of our expertise together, and that was really uh, helpful. And we got the attention of everyone. So water utilities who didn't want to talk to us at first started to see we were working together, and they're like, oh, hey, can I come and play too? Um, and then several folks in the research and academic realms also became really interested in our work. One of the things that we just intuitively built into our project was to have monthly meetings where at every meeting we, we got a status update what's going on with the project, we got to help redefine our direction, uh, but we also had education sessions where we would learn from each other and this sometimes it was about how we manage our water systems and sometimes it was about um, the different mechanisms behind downscaling climate information, so really uh, useful activities. And I noted that we really thought climate change was going to solve this problem, you guys. And this is the result of our analysis, um, a scatter plot that is informative, you know, but it, it doesn't necessarily narrow in um, what we need to be prepared for in the future, right? So this is, this allowed us to, um, well, first we went to, through the full stages of denial, freaked out and said, okay, scientists, you got to get with the picture, right? We need you to figure out what's going on with uncertainty, solve this problem, give us a little more insight of where we're going in the future, and, and you know, we have to make decisions. This is real dollars that we're putting to work here. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of work that was done by Martin Clark, Clark's group uh, at NCAR, and just loads of folks who have been working on uncertainty. But really what we learned is that the more we dive into it, the more uncertainty that's revealed, right? So we really had to either decide that we were going to just deny the situation or embrace uncertainty. So this collaboration allowed us to not only learn about the state of the science, but learn to ask different questions and provide a safe space to ask a lot more questions. OK, I'm going backwards. It's just constant. Um, okay, so this project led to a lot of really important outcomes. It completely informed Denver Water's philosophy, and I'll talk about that in a minute. It informed our work with the Water Utility Climate Alliance, um, but it also informed a huge climate assessment that we do every few years in the state of Colorado. It informed the state of Colorado's analysis that they've done um, on the Colorado River, and the state has done a new Colorado water plan. And the, the approach we took, uh, this co-production, this understanding, embracing uncertainty, 
um, provided them with the opportunity to say, okay, we want to do a different way of planning and plan for multiple futures. So we're using scenario planning in a statewide planning process, which is pretty epic. Uh, and, you know, our group still meets quarterly, and Denver Water has ongoing collaborations with NCAR, with Western Water Assessment, and with Riverside. And these were the three um, research organizations that we worked with. Okay. I click, I, I mouse with my left hand, so apologize for this uh, situation. So here's some examples of our co-production um, activities that we've engaged in with NCAR based on building a trusted relationship with them going through this uh, co-production experience. So I'm not going to go through these, but we were able to look at climate forecasting, decadal forecasting, develop climate diagnostics, right? Look at climate models based on the needs of water resources and water management decisions. We're even working with them to develop some sort of planning, simplified planning tool so we can really do a deep dive into uncertainty theory. So it's really been a fruitful uh, uh, outcome of this initial co-production. So people often ask me uh, what, what it takes for them to approach me and have their science be used in the applied field. So I came up with these four ideas, and it's funny because I was actually at a meeting last month, and they presented these four ideas, you know, with uh, actually um, peer-reviewed literature. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm on the right track. Um, but first, you need trust, right? We need to have a trusted relationship um, with the folks you're working with. I need to understand what it is you're talking about, and I need to understand what <laughs> relevance it has for me to be able to embrace that. I need proof that it works or that it's worth my time, and frankly, I need capacity. Right? If I don't have time to do it, it's not that I, won't want, I don't want to do it, I just am not going to be able to bring that to fruition. And if I also don't have the technical capacity, right, which is also important, it's not just time, it's all the technical work, I'm not going to be able to do um, something with that work. So now you bring co-production in that and this changes a little bit. right? Co-production, working with um, researchers directly from the start, not only builds trust, it builds respect, it builds mutual understanding, which I think is more important than just understanding. Um, the proof is just embedded in the process, right? And the capacity is, is built in because it's something that we're both seeking to achieve. So I want to take a minute to talk about the Water Utility Climate Alliance and the importance of um, this, this Front Range Climate Change group and this project was that it allowed Denver Water to become informed and experienced in climate adaptation, um, in climate assessment, and climate planning. So we were able to join this group, uh, and we were one of the, the beginning members. Um, we're, ten, we're eight, then 10, and now 12 utilities working together on climate adaptation. But we were able to join this group in an informed way. Um, we have a vision, and we have really high expectations for our community that we're gonna, be <laughs> we're gonna have a climate resilient, we're gonna have a world with climate resilient water utilities and thriving communities. And our mission is to collaboratively advance um, water utility climate change adaptation, right? So collaboration is directly there in our mission. Here's uh, uh, some of our activities that we've um, engaged in and the products we've produced over the last several years. We're even doing strategic planning, you guys. It's up in the uh, top corner. But be again, because of the work that we did on the front range study, this initial co-production, we were able to um, participate and lead and direct a lot of this of these activities. So just really quickly, here's Denver Water's climate adaptation program activities and our focus is kind of like our strategic direction. And I've highlighted in our science, we now approach science um, through co-production, right? That's how we want to dive into the science. And you can see towards the bottom, partnerships is a huge part of our program. That is fundamental to everything that we do. So a few reflections really quickly. Um, Co-production is slow, right? If you want to get something done, get it, get it published, be done with it, move on, this is probably not the path for you. Um, it's slow, but it's really informative. It builds lasting relationships. It builds trusted relationships. I can call NCAR up and say, I have a silly question I want to talk through with you, and I feel confident in the response that they give me, and if they don't know the answer, they're not going to say, give me some sort of ego perspective, they're gonna say, I don't know, let's dive into that a little bit more. So we have this, and it's not just with NCAR, it's with the Western Water Assessment, it's with Riverside. It's with these groups that we've built these relationships with. Um, it has caused and led to a philosophy change at Denver Water, 
right? We are asking science to solve the problem. We are asking better questions about what science should be able to provide us and asking science to help meet us along the way. So it's changed our view on what science should provide. Um, of course, it leads to more questions. And for all of us in the room, we like to you know, always have something next on the back burner. It leads to a lot more work. Um, and in my opinion, um, that I think it will change the world, right? Having this relationship with this group of this community that I never anticipated um, having has led to both increase in my confidence, um, it's in increased our credibility, um, but it's also created this mutual understanding that is just invaluable across this interdisciplinary field. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks. And unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but can, uh, you're going to be at the mixer tonight, right? <laughs> Hopefully. Our next speaker is David Robinson. Um, he's the New Jersey State Climatologist, and he's going to talk to us about cocoa rods. Thanks very much, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about something that is near and dear to many people around the nation, both scientists and citizen scientists. First of all, any Coco Ross observers in the audience? Susan is. You got one at the back. I'm as well. Um, this is a wonderful citizen. It's citizen science at its best, and it's a wonderful way to bring in public action personal public action to help answer and solve um, climate issues, engineering issues, issues of all types. So uh, it, it's really a wonderful program and I'm happy to t be here to tell you a little bit about it today. Uh, my co-author uh, on this is Nolan Doskin, who is the founder of the Coco Ross program out of Colorado State University and uh, he sends his best wishes this morning. Um, it's not going, I'm getting a wrong screen here, or the wrong oh, mouse, I have the wrong mouse, so I just have to use that, all right. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so COCORA stands for the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. Nolan made that up. I did not make that up. Um, Coco Raz, as it says here, is a grassroots organization, um, high density precipitation network. The goal here is to gather information on precipitation. Um, there are over 20,000 active volunteers today. I'll give you just a few more statistics on that in a minute. From all age groups, um, from elementary school on up to retirees who make up a number of the Coco Raz observers, and it, it's, it's a backyard type of uh, activity, if you will, or a schoolyard uh, activity. Um, the idea is to get accurate data. It's not difficult to get that. There's an education program involved so that the citizen scientists can be scientists and, and approach their measurements with a scientific rigor. Um, and then once they're trained with tremendous online training, training that might be done locally by visits um, from some of the volunteers who help make up the, the backbone of the organization, they can go out and make really credible science observations. You can see the rain gauge there on the left. That's a standard rain gauge we require of the observers in the program and it's accepted by the National Weather Service as being accurate to a hundredth of an inch. And there at the bottom you see something that may look very strange. It's a hail pad um, that is put out by observers in hail rich regions and once a hailstorm comes and uh, makes its imprint on that pad, the size and number uh, and density of those stones can be studied. Uh, and we're measuring these things at a density uh, and in numbers never before seen. So just tremendously worthwhile. This is the uh, Kokoraz site that you might be drawn to any day when you go to make your observation. You can see the number of observations out there on that particular day. Um, this is your observing form. 
If you bring that up each day, you can enter the amount of precipitation that might have fallen, and that includes zero. Zero is a very important observation, which we try to get through to the observers, but I'd say in New Jersey, about two-thirds of the observers will report most every day, but a good third will only report when there's water in their gauge or uh, some snowfall. Um, but you can make comments on your observations, you can enter your snowfall, you can enter the snow that is sitting on the ground, be it from the most recent snow or cumulative snowfall events. You can talk about the intensity of it. Um, you can mention the beginning and end of the event. You can mention if there's flooding involved, or you can just put in the precipitation observation. This can be done on a computer, and it can be also done on your phone. Um, then you hit the send button, and it gets part of uh, tabular data and put into map form, so you get instant uh, gratification, if you will, that your data have been recorded. Uh, there is quality control done at the local level and some at the national level. These data end up in Asheville, North Carolina, at the National Centers for Environmental Information. They are considered that credible a source of information. How did it all start? Just brief history. Uh, there was a, a deadly flash flood in Fort Collins, Colorado back in the summer of 1997, and it was clear that there were not enough observations uh, from the cooperative program. The radar did, down in Denver didn't quite catch um, all the precipitation that was falling. So the impetus was to go and get citizen scientists involved. It started with high school students working with the Colorado Climate Center uh, and, and Nolan, and then it, it evolved. It evolved to, throughout Colorado, Susan's backyard. Um, it evolved into the High Plains. It went national. Now it includes Canada and the Bahamas as well, where Henry Regas, one of the co coordinators, was down there last week in the Bahamas recruiting observers. A very difficult duty, no doubt. <laughs> um, I mentioned we gather rainfall data, snowfall data, uh, and hail observation. Uh, it is the largest source. It's, it exceeds the number of observations taken in each day by National Weather Service cooperative observers. A wonderful historic program, don't get me wrong, and they measure temperature as well. But this program in numbers exceeds that in this day and age. Um, we have snowfall observations in numbers we've not seen before. Um, people measure the water equivalent of the snowfall, but also the water equivalent of the snow on the ground, which are exceedingly difficult observations to come across, uh, particularly out of the mountainous west as you traverse uh, the east or central and eastern part of the nation. And then the density of hail observations I mentioned are just unique. Uh, in terms of their abundance. Um, this gives you some numbers uh, on the tens of thousands who have signed up. About a third who sign up never take an observation. Uh, their rain gauge never gets purchased, it just gathers dust. Um, but of, the, of those that have taken observations, uh, sometime begun taking them sometime in the last 20 years of the program, a little under half are still taking some observations today. Um, the successes of the story have been getting master gardeners. I talk as state climatologist in New Jersey to a number of different county master gardeners groups and we always pick up some observers. Um, retirees make up a large fraction of the observers. Uh, and then they're just weather geeks out there, weather enthusiasts who stumble across this and just sign on and can share. Friendships develop online between observers. You know, oh yes, you're Somerset County 1 and I'm Warren County 3 and things like that as they exchange. Um, but, uh, and why has it become successful? I, I think I've already alluded to that, so I'll go through these quickly. Um, first of all, it's pretty easy to do. It's not time consumptive. It can get a little tricky on days with snowfall and snow on the ground. Um, and some observers, quite honestly, don't get into it that deeply. Um, but generally, it's pretty quick. <laughs> if it hasn't precipitated and there's no snow on the ground, you open it up, you click submit, and it defaults to zero, and you're done for the day. It is very personal. Um, and, and you really feel the, the worth uh, of making the observation. 
Um, we're all familiar with precipitation. It's part of our life, whether we're a gardener or we're someone worried about drought conditions in our area and the water supplies, for instance. Um, the volunteers are well educated along the way. Nolan sends out notes. We at the state level send out notes to let people know that their, their data are valuable and they're being used. And in a minute we'll see those examples. Um, and then there's a coordinator network. Uh, I share the state coordination with the assistant state climatologist in Jersey, Matt Gerbush. We have county coordinators who help us out on occasion. Um, people can turn to the county coordinators or our office to ask questions or will question their observations and try to educate them how to make a better observation. Um, they see their observations so they get that instant gratification. It doesn't cost anything to join and it's a cheap hobby. Um, you can get a gauge for $35, you can buy a snowboard and paint it for a couple of bucks from, the, from Home Depot or Lowe's um, and get a ruler to measure the snow. Uh, it, it's really a pretty efficient hobby in that regard. Uh, and you're connected, as I mentioned, the friendships. Uh, and it's important, these are two Jersey maps, we do our own unique maps. And you can see the map on the left shows the variety uh, of precipitation uh, totals that fell across the state on one particular day two summers ago. The pink areas are an inch and a half or more of rain. The white, it didn't rain. So you can see the need for a dense network of observers. We had about 200, 225 observers that day. On the right is the rather even distribution of snowfall, three to six inches we had just this past Saturday. Um, there are challenges. We want to get more into the schools. Uh, we want to get to more underrepresented groups. Um, we just had a middle school in Jersey City sign up last week, so we're hoping they'll become active and uh, help with two of those issues. And then, interestingly enough, rural farmers have not been all that active. It's often, if you will, a suburban type program. Um, I mentioned the educational opportunities, not just in participating, but being able to use this information in the classroom. Um, and, and then the organizations that use it, getting down to just how are the citizen sciences contributing to applied science and even pure science in some cases. I'm not going to read you the, the list, but it goes on and on and on. Um, Mosquito Commission, for instance. Um, big issue. It's our state bird in New Jersey. And uh, we were at the forefront over a century ago of, com of mosquito control. And we have mosquito commissions use our data. We have them take data for us, just as one example of how we work with the science community, with Kokoros. Um, a lot of different collaborations involved with NOAA, the Weather Service, uh, the PRISM group out at Oregon State University, and, and others. And here are some of the, the ways the data are used by these organizations for storm warnings, uh, warnings water supply and demand, uh, big time drought, as we'll see with one slide in a second, um, flood control, uh, a lot of infrastructure, building up a database for uh, engineers, uh, recreation planning, environmental education, the list goes on and on. Use your imagination. Because um, one observation can make a big, big difference. There's one a huge number that was verified. It wasn't a decimal point issue. Uh, and it could make a big difference in flood management and control. Um, I mentioned drought awareness. I won't stay longer on that. Uh, the question is, what's next? Well, the app needs a little bit of improvement. Um, we find that most people using the phone app don't make comments. And comments are so useful. That last observation of seven inches in Texas came with a comment. So we knew there was some reliability, some validity to that observation. So that needs some work. A new website's under development um, and, and look forward to some new mapping as well. So there you are, there's your Kokoraz. Uh, go sign up. Um, you can contact Henry Regis or Nolan Doskin or myself and we can lead you towards doing that or just Google kokoraz.org and join the program. Great Christmas gifts those gauges make, and I encourage you all to become active citizen scientists. Thanks very much.
Thanks, David. We do have time for one quick question, please. Kathy? Um, it's really exciting to hear about how you've been able to gauge so many people in science. Can you talk a little bit about what the impact is on them? Does it change their attitudes about science or their understanding of why it's hard to predict the weather or the next flood? Or <laughs> That's a wonderful question. And yes, there is that back and forth. And we make sure, given the way the organization works down to the county level, that we do have this interaction with the, the observers and they can see their data and how it compares to others and we get questions on various issues. So yeah, there is that back and forth that I think makes it all the more valuable because they know they're being respected uh, and along the way they're getting an education whether they know it or not sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. So our, our next speaker is Kareem Ali Kassam, and he's going to be talking about developing a transdisciplinary process and community partnerships um, to anticipate climate change at the local level, the role of biophysical and sociocultural calendars. Unfortunately, uh, Kareem recently had surgery on both his knees, and he's not able to travel. So he's going to be delivering the presentation via recorded. He's watching us now. Uh, remotely. Hi, Kareem. And um, he's going to be on the phone to take questions at the end. And I, I'm excited that he's able to do this, partly because it's great to have him here, but also because I think it's important that when we think about participatory methods of science, we really think about how to be inclusive and engage people who might face barriers to participating otherwise, whether they're temporary or not. So. I would like to share with you a narrative, a story involving biophysical science, social science, and the humanities, and all three working in tandem with local communities to anticipate climate change. This project is occurring. What I would like to do first is go over the objectives of our conversation today. Describe the research context in which we are working. Explain ecological calendars, because that's the tool we are using to anticipate climate change. Provide an overview of our research process, and then reiterate the take-home messages of our work that is currently underway. Therefore, what I would like to illustrate is that diversity of knowledge and experience matters. No one particular type of expertise is sufficient when addressing challenging issues such as climatic variation. Then I would like to show that this co-generation of knowledge requires participation from a community of inquirers such as biophysical scientists, social scientists, and the humanities, as well as communities of practice, such as the farmer, the herder, the fisher, the orchardist, the hunter, and so on. Finally, I would like to demonstrate that adaptation to climatic variation requires ecological and socio-cultural grounding in the local context. We cannot talk about these issues outside of the local context, outside of the village, outside of the valley, outside of the town. We are undertaking collaborative research to build anticipatory capacity for climate change in six sites, specifically the Standing Rock Nation in North and South Dakota, the Lake Oneida watershed in upstate New York, and the Pamir Mountains of Central Asia, in particular the Alai Valley in Kyrgyzstan, the Bartang Valley in Tajikistan, the Shugnan region of Afghanistan, and the Tushkurgan region of Xinjiang, China. Many indigenous and rural societies are at the vanguard of climatic variation even though they did not cause it. It has a direct impact on their livelihood and food systems. 
In fact, it infects the global food system because 70 to 80 percent of the world's food system still depends on small holders. This creates a challenging situation of instability because there is lack of predictability and this causes anxiety in local communities. To those of us who are researchers, this is not just an intellectual challenge, but it is an issue of justice because we have directly benefited from an industrial society that actually caused anthropogenic climate change. An ecological calendar perceives the world as animated, alive with complex connectivity, where a group of people in a particular region have complex relations with other life, such as animals and plants, glaciers, mountains and rivers, as well as other human beings in other contexts. Ecological calendars work when individuals link their livelihood activities and actions to specific indicators and events in their habitat, such as arrival of a migratory bird, the nascence of a flower, the appearance of an insect, the level of snow cover, breakup of ice, and so on. Therefore, imagine a farmer using a celestial calendar like the Gregorian calendar seeds when a flower appears on May 1st and in that normal year in September gets a great harvest. Now what if the following year there is an early rainfall and the flower appears on April 1st. However the farmer waits using the Gregorian calendar for May 1st and reaps a poor harvest in September. However, what if the farmer, with early rainfall, used the seasonal cue of the appearance of the flower and seeded on April 1st? Then the farmer experiences a healthy harvest in August. This is an example, a simple example, of a seasonal calendar. We have, we have found evidence of sophisticated ecological calendars in the Pamir Mountains of Central Asia. These calendars have been in use for at least a thousand years. These calendars are context specific to villages and valleys and therefore are diverse from one village to another. And they mark the complex connectivity of individuals such as farmers, herders, hunters, to their habitat. And therefore, these calendars, from a scientific point of view, are highly empirical. Furthermore, because these calendars have been in use for hundreds of years, they are both cumulative and adaptive. The communities adapted the calendar as seasons and climate changed. Therefore, these calendars are both socio-culturally and ecologically grounded in their habitat. Because of the history of colonization, war, and imposed industrialization, these calendars fell into disuse. We believe that these calendars can be revitalized and be used to anticipate climatic variation. But in order to revitalize these calendars, there is a transdisciplinary perspective that is required, where the anthropologist, the climatologist, the ethnographer, the botanist, the ecologist, the educationist, work in tandem with the farmer, the gatherer, the pastoralist, the hunter, the fisher, and the teacher, where communities of practice come together with 
these two pictures are an example of how communities of inquirers work together with communities of practice. In the first picture, we're setting up a climate station in the village of Sarimagu, Kyrgyzstan, with the help of local villagers. In the second picture, we're collecting ethnographic data, and the young woman seated next to me, who is blonde, is actually indigenous to the region. The research process begins with a meal, where we discuss the nature of our project and planning for the research. Then we sit down and develop a seasonal round. These are examples of seasonal rounds from the Lake Oneida watershed in upstate New York. They link biophysical indicators and cues with livelihood and socio-cultural activities of a community. We use seasonal rounds to develop phenological indicators so that we can begin to revitalize an ecological calendar. This diagram meticulously illustrates the process of co-generating hybrid knowledge. The yellow boxes represent indigenous knowledge and the gathering of indigenous knowledge. The blue boxes represent biophysical data that is being collected, such as soil and climatic data. The green boxes represent the hybridization and the connecting of these various knowledges so that we can then achieve specific outcomes. The reddish pink boxes at the bottom represent specific outcomes such as testable revitalized ecological calendars, the development of curricula for schools so that this knowledge is not lost but continues to be adaptive as the community uses these calendars over time, to develop mechanisms to share insights and experiences between communities from different sites across the world and with scientists and other communities across the world on how to develop ecological calendars and how to implement them. The point I'm trying to make is that in order to build anticipatory capacity at the level of communities, difference matters. Cognitive diversity is key to generating knowledge that is useful to addressing problems such as climatic variation. Because this anticipatory capacity helps communities respond to the practical day-to-day -day issues related to their livelihoods, such as the food systems that we all depend upon. Therefore, any adaptation strategy particularly with relation to climate change. In order for it to be effective, it needs to be grounded in the local social, cultural, and ecological context. This is a photograph of a Kyrgyz boy and I making our way from the mountains of Afghanistan into the mountains of Tajikistan. The Kyrgyz trusted me with their child and a horse so that I could make my way back to my team. The point I'm trying to make is that in order to address such a deep and fundamental challenge such as climatic variation in the 21st century, we need to cross transdisciplinary borders and work in tandem with communities of practice so that we may be able to develop pragmatic and practical solutions to fundamental issues that relate to their livelihoods and our food systems. Thank you for listening to me patiently. Do you have any questions? So Kareem is actually on the phone and available for questions. We have time for one question. 
Um, so, any questions? Uh, there's one over there, Larna. So you're asking about the variability of the calendars because they're in mountainous terrain? Yeah. Okay. Kareem, were you able to hear that? No, I wasn't. Could you repeat that? Yes. Um, one of the questions is about the variability of the terrain and how that influences the calendars. There's a little bit of a delay. Go ahead. Uh, variability caused because of climatic variation and variability because we are at differing altitudes and at different aspects. And what is so powerful about these ecological calendars is that they are in fact context specific. So on the one hand, to revitalize an ecological calendar, it is much more challenging to develop an ecological calendar for a specific valley, a specific village, a specific watershed. But on the other hand, once having developed it, it is extremely powerful uh, because it is context specific. And so the variability is both the strength and the challenge. Thanks. Thank you, Kareem. And thanks for joining us the way you have remotely. Um, and also, thank you to the audience for patience with the technological uh, glitches. Um, our next speaker is Mahmoud Farouk, and he's going to be talking about bridging the expert and citizen divide, integrating public deliberation to inform NASA's asteroid initiative. Mahmoud. Uh, Thank you, uh, Raj, and thank you, the panel, for uh, inviting me to speak uh, as a part of this very distinguished panel. Uh, one uh, thing that I was noting as I was listening, you know, it, uh, like taking Faisal's point, it takes a long time to get success in these areas, and, and it, all, it gets lonely. So to know that there's a community out there who are also struggling with similar issues is very helpful and keeps us motivated, because I was in a conference not too long ago, and we were four of us speaking to an audience of one. So it is still uh, something that uh, you know, needs to gain traction in the larger scientific community. So thank you for organizing and giving me this opportunity. So I'm part of uh, this uh, group of academics and informal science educators and also policy scholars who have been trying to uh, develop a participatory technology assessment capacity in the US. This is common in Europe, but it, has, it is not common here. And we've been working. And our first success of some sort was with this project we had with NASA. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is basically, you know, there's Everywhere you look, there is an increasing demand for public engagement in science policy. But uh, what we struggle with is uh, despite there's a lot of different models and, and, and approaches, we still struggle to actually link science, uh, citizens' input or citizen participation to policy decisions. Uh, and uh, so what we say, uh, what we uh, ended up, and this is borrowing from Lisa's point about design thinking, is try to think about how do we kind of create processes where we can sort of intervene with the policy process. And we came up borrowing from the uh, principles of transdisciplinary design and to incorporate public input in science policy decision making. So out of this three process, uh, three it's a three step process, basically starts with the uh, uh, framing of the problem, then engaging the public, and then integrating the output to decision making, uh, is, is we first got to try it with a project that, uh, a cooperative project with NASA regarding their asteroid initiative in 2014. And uh, that little project actually paved the way as uh, served more than a proof of concept for us to allow to do a number of projects with uh, NOAA on climate change resilience, and then Department of uh, Energy on nuclear waste management. Uh, we are now working on self-driving cars, and then the latest one is on uh, geoengineering governance. So, uh, you know, that little uh, proof of concept actually helped us gain traction and, and do uh, more of this kind of work. 
And uh, we, I, I will conclude with some observations as to you know, all the experiments that we are doing, what we are learning, and what are some of the pathways uh, going forward. So again, to uh, begin, you know, there's been calls for public engagement from uh, all different kinds of places, from uh, National Academy to European Commission, from geoengineering to gene drives to uh, nuclear regulatory folks to uh, bioethics commission. But uh, the main challenge why, why this is, uh, there's a call, but there's still uh, not as much action is because we are dealing with a class of problems that uh, uh, people uh, label as post-normal, meaning that there's high degree of uncertainty at the same time there where you have contested values and contested facts, and, and there is uh, a hard to get where a perfect solution. So uh, the way uh, we had been dealing with this kind of problems in the 20th century, which was our technology assessment, is that we feed, we keep our scientific process and, our, and shielded from our socio-technical discourse, and, and uh, we try to get an answer from the system. And the way we get an answer, either it's uh, applied normal science when we have actually reduced uncertainty and given an answer, or rely on professional expertise to where we rely on expert judgment. But when you have high degree of uncertainty and the decision stakes are high and you haven't resolved uncertainty, but you still need to make a decision, it's, this process doesn't yield a solution. So uh, what, and, and in the face of all of this, what we all have also had is that some of the contemporary challenges that are shaking our scientific universe. You know, there's the reproducibility crisis that came up. There's a, you know, with Flint water crisis, there's a whole uh, transparency problem. There's a, you know, there's this big question in the climate change arena where we are saying, you know, we're getting impatient with democracy and we're saying we know the answer, let's move ahead and let's bypass the system. So with all of these challenges, what uh, my colleague and mentor, uh, uh, Daniel Serowitz, you know, he looking at it here, what his, uh, point, he made the point that science will be made more reliable and more valuable for society today, not by being protected from the societal influences, but instead by being brought carefully and appropriately into a direct, open, and intimate relationship with those influences. So the question is, how do we do that? So what we have imagined is, again, looking at the way we have been uh, addressing uh, socio-technical issues, but imagining a trans this as a transdisciplinary problem. So what we initially do is that bringing both experts and stakeholders to first frame the problem, then we bring in a diverse, representative, informed group of lay public in, in, a, in, a, in a respectable discourse. And then we feed that uh, result of that discourse back into the process. And that also is uh, an iterative engagement. It's not the matter of handing them a result or a yes, no answer, but it's actually working with the, both the scientist and the decision maker in an iterative process where you, you actually even figure out what are the answers that, that's most valuable in this particular context. So we got to experiment with this, uh, the, uh, what will be the left side of uh, uh, this, uh, this metrics, uh, this, this schema working with NASA on, a, on their asteroid initiative. And uh, the, what we did there was working with NASA uh, uh, program managers, uh, trying to first uh, identify uh, what the problem, what the issues they wanted to get input on from the public. And uh, the whole idea was to use provide public views as an input to shape the initiative's direction and further public engagement activities related to it. Uh, so uh, again, the step one was basically engaging with NASA scientists and, and program managers to say what are the topics, what are the issues, what are the questions, what are the content uh, that they needed to uh, get public input on. And one of the things what was uh, at that time, uh, in addition to uh, uh, the matter of detecting asteroid, uh, then uh, deciding how do you mitigate, uh, what are the mitigation strategies, and there was an asteroid redirect mission where NASA was actually looking at two robotic alternatives, so where uh, they were, one was to uh, retrieve uh, uh, a big uh, uh, asteroid uh, or uh, 
land in a bigger one and grab a boulder. And both were kind of technically, scientifically, uh, you know, had comparable returns. So they wanted to get public input on those two choices. And the fourth one was to, to get some input on the journey to Mars. Uh, so we went and after we, the framing of the problem, the step two was to recruit the public. So we did two public forums uh, in Boston and in Phoenix. And we about, recruited about 100 uh, re uh, diverse and uh, representative, not statistically, but representative of the different uh, demographics uh, of those locations. And uh, we have them uh, engage for a day in informed conversations, sitting in tables of uh, six with a neutral facilitator. So the day, the way it looked like, what well, there was a, a planetarium show where they got an overview of asteroids and and uh, all the uh, 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 all the issues uh, associated with the, that and the asteroid redirect mission and journey to Mars. Uh, then uh, we had uh, the day was broken into thematic sessions. Each session be uh, began with a video. Then we had facilitated uh, discussion. And then we had a Q&A with NASA program officers and scientists who answered questions. And then they got to share their views uh, through a survey. They bo answered both uh, quantitative uh, questions and also qualitative, not only answering wha what, but also why. And we collected data both uh, in terms of uh, group activities, so you can see that they, this is where they uh, did a group exercise uh, looking at different detection cap uh, options, and they made plan as a group, and they also uh, shared their uh, individual opinions, and, 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 and these are some of the results we collected. And we also collected observational data. We had table observers, and we did pre and post uh, uh, surveys. So uh, then, as I was mentioning, then comes the result integration part. So when we initially did this exercise, when we went to the, and went back with the answer, we thought that, uh, you know, the most interesting things would be the, you know, how, what percentage of people uh, valued one versus the other. But what we understood uh, through that interaction with the program managers is that they were actually interested in not only the answer, but also how people thought about these issues. So that gave us an understanding that there was actually multiple dimensions, and these are, we list seven of them here, where there's, there's the, the value of this public engagement in terms of NASA's decision-making needs. And uh, so I'm not going to, I don't have time to go through all of that. Uh, so we ended up actually uh, giving NASA uh, interim results, and that actually made it to the, uh, to the decision uh, support document for the administrator for the asteroid initiative. And one thing, I, one comment I made earlier was that this is not a substitutive exercise, this is a complementary exercise. That means this is adding an input that is not currently there. It's not substituting everything that is currently there. So it is adding a public value input to that decision matrix and, and to so that we can uh, be uh, aware of uh, the public value goals as where well we value the scientific and technical goals. And uh, after that, uh, the Government Accountability Office actually did the study and highlighted this as one of the seven uh, exam uh, exam good examples of open innovation in government where you know federal agencies have engaged with the public. Uh, subsequent to that, we got a project with NOAA to look at climate change resilience, and we're looking at f uh, four sets of hazards in eight different cities. Uh, then Department of Energy uh, uh, gave us a project on nuclear waste uh, location, uh, how, the, how you engage the public in making uh, siting decisions. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, then the, we have engaged uh, with the EPA, and then uh, subsequently uh, now we're working on self-driving cars and also the issue of geoengineering governance. So what basically what we are doing now is now blowing up this model, and as Lisa said, you know, innovate. We're doing a lot of uh, the things that we heard all, all about today from citizen science, from uh, uh, more coke production, and all of these different aspects, trying to see how we can sort of expand, learn, and integrate, and create more co-production in the process. So I think I'm out of time, or do I have to? Okay. Uh, 
So it's basically uh, in the in the in the in what I well, in addition to the process innovation, we are also doing institutional innovation. That means that we are. I initially introduced myself as a work academic working with informal science educators. We work with science museums and policy think tanks, and we imagine this as a distributed capacity outside of government, learning from what has previously happened with uh, agencies that like like the Office of Technology Assessment and so forth, which were part of government but defunded. This way we can do sustained engagement. And the way it is also important, because there's a most important criteria here is the honest brokering aspect, and we can do that by being working in this distributed environment. And there is a, a whole branch of interdisciplinary knowledge that feeds into this, and we are doing continuous experiments and so forth. So I will conclude that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Sorry. So we have time for, we do have time for a question. I have a question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really interested in when you started to show how you're collaborating with the informal science community because what I saw in that when you showed it was this huge strategy for engaging the public and learning about science in a deep way. So can you say a little bit more about how those learning experiences are designed and what you're learning, are you doing evaluation to see how people's attitudes towards science and understanding are changing? Yes, yeah, so, when, 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 so when we do pre and post surveys and we see that every time we do this, you know, people's knowledge as a result of engagement change, go from 20% to 70% of whatever subject matter we have engaged. And they all always, and this is the interesting takeaway from all of this, is that they always all, uh, uh, say that there is uh, who do they trust? They say the scientist, but they always also say that there's not enough op opportunity for them to participate in the process. So it's not about that they're trying to replace scientific judgment with personal values, but they want to be a participant in that process and engage with the scientists. So that's what I, I think we, we are seeing in all of our experiments. Nice, very nice, thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much. I want to thank all of our speakers. Um, at one point, Larna said something that I thought was kind of profound. She said a lot of things that were kind of profound, but one of the things that hit me was, this is epic. <laughs> yes. This is epic. I think what you're seeing in these talks is a glimpse into the future of science. And it's a future in which science includes research, education, engagement, and it includes um, application and it includes them all seamlessly and equally, giving them all equal credibility. It's a future in which we do science with diverse people and we welcome diverse kinds of knowledge into the scientific arena. I think it's a future in which scientists are appreciated for what they bring to the table and for what they take back to their lab. And it's a future in which the boundaries between the lab and the table are blurry where it's hard to tell where science starts and stops and where the real world begins. I think it's a future where science is embedded and accessible, and it's a future in which science is diverse, diverse in every sense of the word, diverse in the questions it asks, diverse in the communities it serves, diverse in the people who participate, and diverse in the methods it uses. I think it's a science that's offered with humility and grace, and it's a science that recognizes that it's both necessary and insufficient. Um, and, and what I want to ask, all of these things start small, and, and we're small, but we're powerful, right? So join us in this effort. It's not, as Mahmoud said, it's not substitutive, it's additive, right? We're offering new tools and new methods to the scientific process, and you can be part of that. And you can be part of that in a bunch of ways. Um, attending sessions like this is part of it. Talking about what you've learned, what you've done here when you get back home. If you're in a position of power, creating ways for others to take these paths and explore these paths. Um, Mark talked about the importance of metrics and how those are important. And I'm sort of convinced that part of the reasons publication count is because we know how to count them. And if we knew how to count some of these other impacts, we might have ways to make those parts of career paths and parts of reward structures. Um, look for other science to action sessions throughout the day. There's some today, there's some tomorrow. Um, look at Community Science Connect at the AGU website. It's a forum for participating in community science. And if you're really jazzed and you want to try it like in the next five minutes, there's a workshop coming up 
um, in upstairs in room 300, in room 224, not only a little bit more upstairs. And it's a workshop to work with the owners of the convention center to think about how the roof could be reimagined as a piece of green infrastructure and as, um, and as a community asset. So with that, I, I just wanna, I wanna show you a couple of pictures, right? Because one of the things I think that's, that's tempting in, in geosci economics is sometimes called the dismal science. I think we're the dismaler science. <laughs> right? John Maynard Keene said, in the long run, we're all dead. In geoscience, we're not even showing up except as a blip in the long run, right? And when we do show up, we screw the place up. The Anthropocene is about the legacy of human impact, right? And that's a perspective that I think is inherently pessimistic, but inherently realistic. It's a plague of our profession. An example of this is, is an artist from Seattle named Chris Jordan, who does a series of works that try to help people understand the impact they're having on the planet. This is one called Bamboo Forest. It's, it's, it's almost actual size. And as you walk closer and closer to this image, what you realize is that you're actually looking at stacks of paper bags. It's 1.4 million paper bags, which is the number of paper bags that are thrown away in the United States every hour every hour, right? That's a pessimistic view of humanity. That's a view of humanity that says we're part of the problem, we're destroying the planet. It makes you worry about what happens when we go from 7.2 to 9 to 11 million, billion people on this planet, right? But there's another piece of art that Chris created, and it's called E Pluribus Unum, and it looks like a giant mandala. But as you walk closer to this picture, what you see is it's the, the name of over a million different organizations that are devoted to social justice, to peace, to environmental conservation, and to the preservation and maintenance of indigenous culture. And that's a different view of humanity. That's one that doesn't see humanity as a problem, but sees them as potential partners, as people who can work with us to fulfill this vision of science offered with humility, with grace, with, um, with compassion for the world, who can help us offer our science as part of building a better world for ourselves, our children, and all the other beings on the planet. And what I'd like to encourage you is to think about that version of humanity and think about that vision of the possibility and take that forward. Thanks very much. And I think our speakers are hanging around a little bit, so if you want to come up and talk, that would be great. Thank you. Enjoy <laughs> and lunch. And don't forget, tonight. Uh, Rusty Nail. Yeah, and tonight, uh, meet up, Rusty Nail, um, where there'll be an opportunity to talk even more about community science and also keep um, your fluid intake up, which is important to do. Thank you for doing it. Thank you.